Okay, we're now live and let's just Skype David. Hi David. Hello. Cool. I'll just turn my camera off. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. So is it is it sounding good? Looking fine? Sounds good my end. Um, good. And uh, it's live and there are six viewers at the moment. So. Oh, six? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Which includes us good. two. So there are four additional. <laughs> so, up there we're going to start on schedule at 2056 uh, at, at uh, eight o'clock so well you better explain to them that on this first one we can't do questions and answers i think it's going to be difficult yeah um, yeah no that's fine as long as a question and answer how would that work they'd, they'd have to skype you a question well on the full platform uh, mm. there's a little bubble which um Oh, actually, you can uh, conversation. You can type questions in the right-hand part of the of the uh, of the screen. Now, what I've got to do is the right-hand part of the screen. Um, you'll see at the top of the live stream page. And if you, it looks like a question. Beach I don't have that, so I can see. Uh, okay. I have a little heart, a little arrow, a little eye in a circle, and then a square with an arrow in it. Okay. No. Okay, maybe that's just on on my one, and I can't. Uh... I mean. I haven't tried to log in. Do I need to log in? I, I don't feel like pressing anything if it suddenly goes well, wrong. If wrong. anybody who's actually watching, there are 10 there, so we'll start in a minute. Um, mm -hmm. Then their questions, if they can do them, will pop up. Now, on playback, that is there, so people can put the questions in, in then. Um, so at the end, is put put it on playback so that the people can then just start typing right. in their questions and we'll take take them on Skype. And if anybody wanted to email me their Skype, I can Skype them and you know uh, we can have a chat. Because okay. on the live stream, I can't see you. I've just need it. I haven't pressed go live or log in. Okay. Well, you don't need. That's you can't press unless you have to or someone tells you to. Yeah, now I'm here, so I'm, I'll am i appear in your Skype screen, but I'm turning that yeah, off. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah, so mm. I've, I've turned that off to protect the um, bandwidth. Right. And my, uh, my, my thing is coming out on the screen as, as yeah. we go along. It looks okay. like it's just dropped the connection. Right, okay, so... What's the time? 20.59. So uh, yeah. let's, um, let's make a start. Well, as long as you're getting something. I don't have anything on my live stream window, but that's fine. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you may as well turn yours off as well. I know it's there. Um, and uh, I think the thing to do is is to have as much of your processing power on keeping the Skype call at the best quality oh. possible. So here we are. It's nine o'clock, or eight o'clock, you taste summertime. Hello to our viewers um, and welcome to this of the Gollum X1V blog. Now, we're going to do an interview about an hour and then we will try and do some question and answers afterwards. Um, and I wanted to start the interview, David, with some uh, biograph uh, biography stuff. Now, in your Wikipedia article, um, it says North Shields and grew up in 1970s London. Now, your father was Adrian Malone, who made uh, a and uh, you studied in America, where you studied well biological anthropology. Now, I wanted to ask you about um, you know your early life, where you went to school, and how you went to Swarthmore, which is quite an elite college. Um, was there a culture shock? Is there a, like, any story in there? What, going to Swarthmore? Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose there was, because um, when we lived in England, I just went to the um, Ashford Grammar School, Ashford and Middlesex, mm -hmm. uh, and then we moved to America. And um, I... We ended up going to two private schools, which I'd never been to before, um, and that really was a culture shock. Um, and I went there because my parents were told that American uh, state schools, were whether they were or not, but that's what my parents believed. Uh, and then when it came to university, I wanted to go to the best university I could and the most left wing. The most left-wing college in America. Right. Um, what I can say is, if that's the most left-wing college in America, they need help. Um, and it was full of um, very rich boys and girls. Mm -hmm. uh, so I spent my four years complaining, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't like a lot of them, uh, but it was a very good university. Uh, but I, I found I didn't have a lot in common with them. Right, and did you do a further degree after your, I'm assuming it's a Bachelor of Science? Or... Yeah, um, I didn't actually, Roger. Uh, some, in some ways, it's, it's one of the few things in life I look back and I think maybe I should have, um, because not having, uh, uh, excuse me a second, I'm sorry Roger, I should have turned that phone off, I thought I had. <laughs> I'll be right back. This is live, folks, the uh, perils of live streaming. We've lost our interviewee I temporarily. I thought I'd turn that off. I have now. Okay, no problem. Um, I didn't go on um, to do a better high degree. In some ways, I thought I should have, because not I have a PhD means that you, if you get in, into any kind of discussions with people, uh, they tend to assume that you don't know what you're talking about, which is very annoying. Okay, well, but I didn't because um, what I enjoy is between things, you know, the borders between art and science, or the border mm -hmm. between this science and that science. And I realized you couldn't do that in a PhD. Right. Um, you have to plow an established furrow, and I just didn't want to do that. So I didn't go on. Um, perhaps it was a mistake, but the job I've done since um, has suited me because it's all about making connections between things. So, yeah. so, what, so you did your bachelor's degree, and uh, I mean, obviously, in between. I'm, I'm, I'm getting PhD. feedback, unfortunately. I think. Do you want me to try and turn live stream off? I think if you turn live stream off on your screen, it'll be a good idea. There you go, gone. Cool. So, I mean, it is out there, and. Uh, we we know that people are are, are watching. So, um, right. So you you did your bachelor's degree, and what year yeah. did you graduate? Uh, Nineteen eighty five. I, mean, I have to say, I was at university at a dreadful time in America. Um, it, to be there during Reagan and Thatcher was just 
awful. And it was also the, it was so libertarian and right wing. Mm -hmm. um, I was in endless arguments with people. But well, this supposedly left wing college. Yeah. Well, it was left wing, but left wing in an American context. Um, oh. So, I mean, left wing amongst fairly wealthy middle class intellectual people or their children okay. uh, to me struck me as about i don't know lib dem okay this was quite good training for the green party then i <laughs> <laughs> yeah, steady, Roger, steady. so anyway um between 1985 when you left uh swarthmore yeah. Um, that, that gives us seven years to the first documentary I've got you here wow. listed in your biography. Um, yeah. What about the interregnum between, uh, you know, how does a, a graduate of uh, biological anthropology, whatever the mm. hell that is, I, I think... <laughs> um, I, I, did, I have to confess, I did make that up. There is, at the time, there was no such thing as bioanthropology, but I quickly realised that how impressed people were with your made with you to how impressive the name was i see so bioanthropology sounds very long and very impressive so yeah, okay I just well, made th th there's a wikipedia article now about bio uh, biological no, anthropology excellent. so it's now a category <laughs> so <laughs> excellent but um, the, the, the time you're talking about, the first year after, after I graduated, I was a teacher. I was a teacher in America teaching fundamental biology for a year until they fired me. Um, uh, I taught in a, an inner city school in a place called East Orange, and it was by far and away the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, whenever I um, felt sorry for myself, I think back to that experience, and then I think, yeah, well, this is nothing. <laughs> where, where, where is East Orange? It's right next to Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and it is a, well, it was a truly horrible place, very poor, um, and just violent, and also that was the year that crack hit um, East Orange, I don't know about elsewhere, but that was the year I lost, I lost several kids to crack. Wow, um, uh, this was in um, 1986? 85, 86, yeah, that, that so. academic year, um, and yeah, it, they, they were... Looking back, they were great kids. At the time, it was really, really hard. I had no training as a teacher. I just went and did it. Um, and yeah, it was very, very tough. It was all they could do to survive, never mind learn. Um, um, what, age they group, did learn. what age group were you teaching? Uh, between 15 and 18, depending on how many times they repeated things. Um, my kids, I, you know, being the in the department I got to teach the, the, the lowest stream or whatever you'd call it mm -hmm. so the other teachers merrily re referred to my kids as the animals oh, okay. it was not nice. and they were tough mm -hmm. they were really tough kids but they had really tough lives yeah um, and then as I say they fired me so I did that for a year um, and then went back came back home I mean back to Europe tried to get all kinds of jobs you know got turned down a lot finally got uh, a job blasting in a tunnel in the alps through friends i have lots of friends in france mm -hmm. i lived there for quite a while um and then um almost by accident got a job uh, at the bbc I, I i wasn't trying to get a job at mm -hmm. the bbc i was in contact with someone at the bbc asking for their help to put me in contact with some academics um had a long conversation and then the fellow said um, by the way do you want a job by pure luck, I happened to be having this conversation at a time when the next week they wanted to recruit a researcher. Okay. And he said, and I, I applied and, and, and got the job. Yeah, but I, I have to say, until that point, I would have said, I know free world rubbish. It's all predestined fate. Serious philosophical point that you're making there, or well, no, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, it does undermine your 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 feelings about free will when you find that you end up doing the same job as your dad and you never want, not for a, a nanosecond ever wanted to. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I know the feeling. Um, so, so. 
went back from America and you went to France. Then you dug a great big hole through the Alps. And well, oh, so, well, so this researching people. job was what was that in the yeah, late eighties? Right. Yeah, I mean, I was just hired as a researcher, and you know, it, that was the very end of the old BBC. Um, the BBC changed from the old. Okay, so you were there at the there. time that um, Alistair Milne got the boot. Yeah, yeah, right. and uh, it, it it was um, it was still there at the end. I was working for three different producers. They would come in and say, oh, "Find me the number of CT scanners in London," and someone else would say, "Find me, you know, the acreage uh -huh. that planted with." this or that or the other and i just did that and then of course what happens is after you've done that for a while one day someone comes in and says uh we need someone to do this short film uh, mm -hmm. yeah you yeah you in the corner there you do it and off you go okay. so so were you in a, like a general news team or was it attached to one of the you know a, a program we might have known about i think you, did you uh, mention... well um, it was a program which was on the air for i can't remember now four or five years called antenna um on bbc2 it uh -huh. was a um a magazine program that ran two 20 minute films and a 10 minute film which was supposed to sort of be a complement to horizon okay. and I, I, I worked on that and then i was sent for two two punishment duties to tomorrow's world when i did very bad things they would send me to tomorrow's world and that um, was a punishment well it was for me <laughs> and in fairness tomorrow's world didn't like me um although the editor was very tolerant um i was not good news on tomorrow's world wasn't cut out for it so i would get sent there yeah and then at some point i'd do something really dreadful and then eventually i ended up in horizon okay so then that led into well, what i a pretty illustrious career um what, what, well, what, I, I what, independent yeah what what's your what, what's your favorite of the different documentaries that that you've made that are listed on wikipedia or others well the, the most political two that i made were which i i, I like um was uh, the 30th anniversary of Horizon, which someone's just pirated and put up on um, YouTube, which was lovely after okay. all these years. Um, it's called Horizon 30th Anniversary, The Far Side. And the other one was called Icon Earth. And both of those films I got in a lot of trouble for and had to defend my job, particularly Icon. Okay. Will you tell us about Icon Earth? I mean, you've told me about that before. It's a very interesting yeah. story. Icon Earth, I made in 1996. I think it was 96. Basically, I was looking at the then GATT negotiations, you know, the, which was the, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. When we ratified that round, the Uruguay round, it gave birth to the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. And I was appalled by it and wanted to do something against globalization. But being in the science department, they wouldn't let me. Yeah. So I then said, well, I know what. Um, I want to make a film about that the image of the blue planet you know the little blue planet um, yeah. uh -huh. as a modern icon like a religious icon in other words an image which tells a whole set of beliefs and they were willing to commission that although not the head of horizon it was commissioned over his head um they controlled the bbc to commissioned it directly which made me unpopular um who was that then it wasn't alan yin top then was it or... no it was um michael jackson Okay. Um, and he, he liked my films and um, so essentially I did make a film uh, uh, warning about globalization but in the uh, under the camouflage of, of a thing about the earth as a blue mm -hmm. so it was, it was a it was a full-on piece of propaganda um, which I really liked <laughs> <laughs> It's, I, yeah. I, I have a soft spot for that film. I really, I really like it, and um, had a fantastic interview with um, Teddy Goldsmith. Okay. So uh, he and he and um, Vanna Shiva basically lay out the problems that are now being discussed about globalization. Right, and Teddy Goldsmith is the pub was the publisher and founder of the Ecologist magazine. Yes, and, so James and, Goldsmith's and, brother, and uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, brother Zach, of Zach Goldsmith, Smith, the, the original corporate raider. Okay. 
Right, yes. And yeah. Zach, yeah, Zach Goldsmith's um, uncle. Yeah, uh, f famous from Richmond and the by-election there, which we will probably get onto later. Yeah. Um, now, in that sort of context, you've already mentioned that you were s wanting to go to a left-wing college. Um, mm. And uh, obviously that's sort of some sort of nascent political... Uh, attitude sort of welling up there i suppose um sure the gap... well, don't forget my grandfather and my mother were both extremely political so um well, i know you've told me before your mum was a marxist but you, your dad wasn't yeah. yeah and my grandfather was a marxist who was a early member of the num and was a big influence on me when i was little mm -hmm. okay and what I'm trying to do is just in the timeline, because that's sort of 95, 96, you make Icon on Earth, and that's when GATS going on. Where does that mm. fit in with NAFTA? Did, did you see any of that stuff? The, um, yeah. the, the Perot and the uh, uh, Gore election, uh, yes. where, 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 but, but... where Gore got beaten by Clinton, didn't he? Yeah. The problem is, don't forget, um, I was in the science department um, at the BBC, and then um, what I was hired for was making science, history, philosophy documentaries. Um, it was very difficult um, political. Um, and during that time, the time you're talking about, I was twice approached directly by both the head of um, science at BBC and the then head at Channel 4, to make a film, they they requested that I make the film, say, and you know, steady on, Roger, because I know what you're, you think about this, but they wanted me to make a film saying um, climate change is um, uh, is a hoax, is a load of old rubbish, mm -hmm. which I refused, um, okay. mm -hmm. because um, at that time I thought there was just no basis for making that claim. Um, but it, it, it clearly... I think shows that there was a there was a political agenda within the mainstream um, um, broadcasters, which was had already made up its mind against um, um, a lot of environmental matters, but certainly anything to do with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, it, it was difficult to to do things that dealt with politics or finance. Um, the, the next one I, I managed to make was High Anxiety, which was um, the Mathematics of Chaos, and that was mm -hmm. 2008. 2008, yeah, I suppose it was. I lose track of what was when. Um, and, and that was very definitely about the, the financial crisis that I could see coming. Yeah, I um, mean, that's... But again, yeah. I had to hide that that's what it was about under mathematics. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, and it was, I mean, you know, it's not that I lied to the broadcasters. I always did deliver the thing I said I would, but I also tried to get it to do the thing that I wanted it to do at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, that, um, and that film was broadcast. We actually broadcast the day after Lehman Brothers went down. But there, so I was definitely, whatever, whatever you think the merits or demerits of the film were, I was on the money um, and I... I, I I clearly said this is going to happen at a time when all the all of the mm -hmm. the, the um, financial reporting and all of the current affairs people were looking the other way. Yeah. And once that went out, I then said to them, "Look, I was on the money. I've got another film I'd like to make in this area. Can I make it?" To which the reply was, um, "No, you're a science center act. Leave this to the big boys at current affairs." Right. Because I, I, you know Charles Ferguson, don't you? Who made the Oscar-winning film um, about yeah. that crisis? Mm -hmm. um, it was an inside job he made, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's funny because the film against climate change that's been made several times and was made, you know, yeah. uh, around that time. I, I think Channel Four did make it, didn't they? The uh, the Great Global did, Warming awesome Swindle, I think that one's called. The Great Global Warming Hoax so, or something. Yeah, I think it's called The Great Warm, uh, Global Warming Swindle. Um, oh, that's so, right. th th that, that time is when we kind of get to know you in the, you know, the monetary reform 
refugees yeah. from the financial crisis, including myself. I mean, I came yeah. across you in 2011 on the right. Golem yeah. blog. Uh, many viewers will know you from the Golem blog. So how did the Golem blog happen and the uh, debt generation book? Um, in the same sort of way that, that, that getting into television happened by accident. I, I wish I could claim to have been a, you know, a man of enormous foresight and great planning, but it wouldn't be true. Um, I was just started writing um, as a putting comments in the online Guardian, you know, under under the articles, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I just did that uh, because I was outraged by what I saw going on. Because once the crisis started unfolding, I could just tell there was something that smelled bad. There was a huge gap between what I could see going on and the official story. So all I did in being frustrated with the, the official stories, I went to the, the boards where day traders talk to each other, and there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. um, and most of what they write is, is a bit impenetrable if you're not a trader, you know, mm -hmm. invest, at, you know invest at 30 with a stop out at 35 and there's something at 22 and you know, you think, well, it's... but in between times, they talk to each other about what they think is happening. Now, most of those people were to the right of Genghis Khan. They were mostly American, mostly really quite right-wing libertarians. So politically, I wouldn't have a lot in common with them. But what was quickly obvious is the analysis that they made between them when they were saying, what do you think is going on, was often, was usually really accurate. Um, and I, re I realized that it was honest, even to the point where the points that they were making argued against their own political ideology, uh -huh. for the simple reason that they couldn't afford to lie to themselves. Because yes. whatever their analysis was, they were going to bet their own money the next day. Yes. Yeah. And the more I read it, the more it just diverged. There was the official story, and there was what was happening, and the, the, the day traders were on it. Yeah. Uh, and so I, re I, I read that stuff. Um, and got more and more outraged by the sort of concerted campaign of disinformation. You know, uh -huh. everybody, every single um, pundit who was ever wheeled on, you know, from Stephanie Flanders on down, they all said, it's, a, it's just a, a liquidity crisis. And the traders could clearly see uh -huh. this was not a liquidity crisis, this was a solvency crisis. Uh -huh. um, they knew and therefore they shorted things and some of them made an absolute fortune so I just started writing that stuff um, I wrote a lot and um, over the time various peoples uh, became quite well known in that little that little world and mm -hmm. they said start writing a blog I, I said no a couple of times because I, I, I didn't fancy it um, um, but once people have asked you enough it starts to become rude to say no and I thought oh right well sod it I yeah. will and so well, then I started writing the blog. Out well, of the blog, then uh, an old friend of mine had read it and said, can I turn this into a book, please? Uh -huh. I was flattered and pleased, and, and he did. Yeah. So although it's got my name on that book, and I wrote the words, I really didn't do any of the work he did. Okay. Mark well, that book actually has a very good website, The Debt Generation, with some mm. really nice readings of, of some of the, the blogs that, that you read that are embedded in there. And it's embedded on your candidate website as well. I, I, yeah. there's, a, there's a page with that there if, if people want to go and have a look at that. It's, it's quite easy to find on David's candidate website. Um, in the beginning of uh, Gollum X1 Fit, you were pretty prolific. The, 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 you were writing... ...watching from the... Uh, um, progressive momentum uh, blog. Mm -hmm. um, you'll know Bill. Bill. Hello, uh, Bill. We, yeah, well, uh, Bill. Bill's uh, trailed the interview on his website and had been a writer. And Bill's question to you is when are you going to start blogging again? You know, even mm -hmm. just once a month. You know, your, yeah. I, th I yeah, think I the know. quote no, I, is your public demands. Yeah, I feel bad, Bill. I do. Um, it's a combination of events. Um, there's been quite a number of really tough things that have happened at home, which has just 
meant I, 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 I didn't have the, um, it's more emotional um, horsepower, more than mental. And, and that's put a big dent in things. But I, I, and, and I'd say that's, in some ways, that's the main thing. But, but the other big part of it is um, so little has changed in the nature of the crisis that I often think I, I should write about this. And I think the same thing four, four or five times, you know, with the, 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 the things which the banks and the central banks and the politicians are doing and the, and the phrases they're using. They're just doing the same thing over and over and again. And how many times can you can you say, look, the banks that they're propping up, are, they're not just. It's not a liquidity crisis. It's a solvency crisis. Some of these banks are still insolvent. How how many times can you say, look, how can they, they have still bad debts after all this time? How can a Spanish bank or a Landis bank, or but the Spanish banks are a better example, s suddenly go down? few weeks ago on the basis of bad debts that were made 10 years ago, some of them. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? Yeah. And of course, we, we, you know, I've, I've written about it several times. It's just, you know, you, the old loan is, is not being paid and is going to expire. So you just roll it into a new loan and suddenly yes. the new loan is up to date. And when that one gets a bit behind, you put it into another new loan. Yeah. And, and you know, the talk about aus austerity, it's the same mantras just repeated and repeated and repeated and I, and I think to myself can i really just refute this or take issue with it again yes yeah um and so i i i, I want to write something new rather than just repeat myself but apart from that excuse i mean you're right bill i should write um um i oh. just feel that just making the same criticisms of the same idiots um it's difficult to to gear yourself up to do it <laughs> yeah because they I, are the same idiots i, I think your, your analysis is so incisive and memorable and it explains things in an accessible way um yeah. I, well, that's nice I, say. I, I think we do know that a lot of the politicians that trot out their sort of pieties yeah. Uh, are are clueless genuinely they they don't know like a number of them probably do think that the magic money tree doesn't exist um, <laughs> yeah so. you're right some of them are just genuinely useful idiots um and the ones that do know what's going on either benefit from it or um are too afraid to say anything yeah now, i mean when i started reading your blog um it was the righteous anger that that i really mm. identified with and you know talking about people's pension provisions people's uh uh you know the austerity and benefit sanctions yeah. that uh you know when when the tories came in and headed off a recovery at the pass with austerity and mm. the eu doing the same thing now you and i call those sorts of policies neoliberal um I mean, for the viewers, um, would, would, would you explain what your understanding is of the, we were talking about left wing and right wing libertarians and the American approach. Uh, can you explain yeah. something of, of how you read that, that political ideology, which seems to be everywhere? You know, Tony Blair is yeah, no different see, to Margaret Thatcher It's a good question. The, the, the problem is, although you and I would, in the short her hand, will call it um, neoliberal, I know what I mean by that, and it, I've, expound, I've explained it through the blog, but the problem is um, people on the left will look at, this, at the way the, the crisis is being managed and say, this is a, a neoliberal disaster. Mm-hmm. this is a disaster cooked up in the private banks, unregulated private banks. The people, the, the people on the right, neoliberals, will look at the disaster and say, this is a Keynesian left-wing disaster, on the grounds that um, governments have been intervening massively and taking, from their point of view, printing up money, taking on debt, and pumping government money in to no avail. And so each of them wants to see that the problem is in the other camp. 
The libertarians want to see the problem is with the government and, and government intervention and the Keynesian model, you know, government. Uh -huh. and, the, and the people on the left say, no, no, want to see it as a libertarian, uh, an unregulated. Um, and the problem is, in some ways, they're both right and both wrong. But those who want to just not, rather than get to the bottom of the problem, just want to fly the flag for their side and blame it on the other, they can get locked, and I, I think they are locked in this pointless combat, um, because the 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 libertarians are well. Sorry, the, the left wing is is right that this was a problem and still is a problem of pr the private sector, the private banks, pri private financial institutions um, taking extending loans that were never going to be repaid uh, and saddling themselves with debts which would blow them up and then saying we're so big if you let us blow up the world the sky will fall in and you must bail us out so the left wing is right that that's the nature of the problem it is unregulated um, private sector they created it there, there wasn't a vast out of control public spending in 2008 you know UK debt to GDP in 2008 was 43 percent which was historically low and hadn't been going up. It's a small increment. By 2013, our debt to GDP was 86%. It had doubled. Well, it, it wasn't a, a, a left-wing government, a government spending binge giving nurses 5,000% increases in salaries. What had happened is we spent 1.4 trillion bailing out private banks and saving their, their private bondholders from having to take the loss that they should have taken. Yeah. But the, but the right wingers, the libertarians, are right that we have had a series of governments, left and right, pumping vast amounts of, of, of public money in, which they've raised through um, taking on debt, public debt, and they have pumped it in. And so that does look like the right wing are, are right, that it's a, it's, the government response has been fatuous. What they, what they miss is the fact that... Um, Pumping public money in isn't necessarily a bad thing. But what Keynes never said, what Keynes said is you must, you, you, the government can intervene when, the, when the, the private sector fails and put money in to keep the, the wheels turning. But what he said is you've got to put it in in an economically productive way. And that's what our governments haven't done. They haven't put it in in any kind of economically productive way. They could have spent that money um, in promoting small and medium enterprises. But they didn't. They shoved it into moribund banks where it disappeared and did no economic good at all. Yeah. I and think, so it's... Yeah. I, I, I don't want to see it as a left versus right problem because both sides have been utterly fatuous. Yes. And, and have missed the point. I it, think it, at this point, if I can just interject, I mean, your blog sure. has a very large constituency of MMTers and I have a lot of respect for MMTers, even though I have yeah, political differences with them. Um, then there are the positive moneyers, the honest yeah. moneyers. Um, money is a construct which most people think they understand, but don't. Mm. Like that. And yeah. uh, I think on your blog, um, there are plenty of posts of your own and then other hell I, I think you mentioned positive money back in quite in the early days of positive money I, re I reviewed the book when it first came out yeah um so in terms of that question yeah. um i mean if we sort of give the shout out to mosla mitchell um and then steve, steve Keen, Keen, who's kind of in yeah. the middle and then uh, the positive money and uh, which is ben dyson's lot and uh yeah. Uh, Fran Botan, I think it's Fran Botan is the new head of research there. Mm -hmm. And people like Professor Richard Werner and uh, yeah. they're, they're all there. Um, but people watching you as the green candidate for the green leadership, if we move on to the green leadership now, mm. um, one of your points was the Green Party doesn't seem to know anything about economics and finance and if it does it doesn't talk about it so yeah, can we yeah. dive I mean there are people in the Green Party, Party who know quite a lot about it but when it, it, it's given no prominence it's 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 not given a lot of prominence in um, 
our manifesto, it certainly wasn't the last one, and it's not something that, that we, that our leadership puts at the forefront of, of, what, a, of what green politics is about. And I think that's a mistake. I mean, my feeling has always been that no party is going to be able to deliver on the promises it makes you in election year unless they can run and control the economy, or yeah. at least run the economy. And we certainly won't deliver on saving the environment unless we first regain democratic, some semblance of democratic control over our um, economy. I think these things are inextricably bound, and therefore I think it's wrong and just silly to talk about all the things we want to do mm -hmm. without making it absolutely dead center of what people think about when they hear the word green. We, we, we have to make uh, our economic and financial policies and our economic and financial understanding absolutely central. Otherwise, people think we're a party with a lovely wish list of things, but the same way that, um, you know, my kids could have a lovely wish list of things, you know, the, the, the list you write for Father Christmas. You have no idea how Father Christmas is ever going to deliver these things, but you write the list, number one, number two, number three, number and, and I find that a huge yeah. Well, it problem. helps to know about and the magic. I'd just like to say about the positive money and MMT, I've never gotten into the middle, I refuse to get into the middle of the, of the kind of the tribal warfare that goes on. I understand that there are differences, and I understand, I think, some of those differences. But the main insights that they share are the important thing. Yes, and I do I sometimes that. despair that it becomes a little bit like Monty Python. Yes. yes. Yeah. People's Liberation Front of Palestine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. MMT. Ah. Yeah. You know. Passions run high. You don't need yes. to. Yeah. You know. um, so, backing back to 2015, um, yeah. you did say. Uh, in the 2016 leadership campaign that you fully expected there to be another election coming up. Um, yeah. The 2015 manifesto got me interested in the Green Party. I've never been interested in it before. Um, mm. How did a party that produced one of the most radical reforming manifestos of the second half of the 21st century, including the Labour 45, um, mm throw out the garbage which I felt the 2017 manifesto was. It was lightweight, woolly, and it didn't have the all-important policy EC661, which was the uh, taking yeah. back the, the, the creation of money um, process into into public administration, if, you know, if not yeah. like a, a, you know, a, 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 a kind of a cross-balance committee sort of thing. Uh, yeah. How did that happen? What 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 is happening with what happened with consultation under Natalie Bennett that didn't uh, happen under the yeah. Bartley Lucas regime? Yeah. Well, I can't give you to the inner the inner workings. I, you know, don't forget, I don't live in London. I'm not part of GPEX, so, you know, the, the, the 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 executive. Um, I live in Scarborough, and I'm not. Um, Although the, the, although the people on, in those people, the leadership know me, I'm not on the Christmas card list and I'm not pals with them or anything. So I don't know from the inside. What I do know is a couple of things. One, there's been a long, long effort on behalf of some uh, a group of people to get that policy about monetary reform and taking the power of money creation away from the banks. It had taken a long time to get that passed. It was a big struggle. Um, and many people in the Green Party, it got passed, but without a lot of people in the Green Party really understanding the significance of it. Who's now on the um, monetary um, uh, study group, um, ex uh, Bank of England. Um, I don't know him. By all accounts, he's very good in, on lots of things, but he's very much against that policy because he, he takes a very old-fashioned view of what money is and, and you know, therefore he he's in, thinks austerity is necessary and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And so there's been a kind of a pulling back um, on those committees from that um, uh, the policy and that radical policy, which I think is a massive mistake. Um, but that, given that 
there was that that pullback and the fact that that I think in its you know in the, at the national level for uh -huh. the election it took them by surprise that didn't help I mean I, I told my local party on the day of uh, the count that we had I said 18 months to get ready for the next election so I was uh -huh. a bit off well, well, you, 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 were you, you, you were you know <laughs> It was very made a pretty good shout. Uh, too bad. Another Obviously election, and, and I said it would be. I, I thought it would be um, uh, Theresa and Boris, um, but the other way around. Mm -hmm. I thought I actually thought Boris would be the leader and Theresa May would be Home Secretary, and it turned out the other way around. Um, May, I think. Um, well, he's a devout. But there was, but, but, uh, to, just to finish off, the last yeah. thing is that our present leadership have a very different set of concerns so had they had a, a, a focus on um, on the importance and getting get democratic control back if they saw the lack of democratic control as an important thing I think they would have then the uh, they would have pushed a more radical um, manifesto like 2015 but that wasn't their focus they weren't focused on particularly on the TTIP. Um, I and others pushed that, and, and it sort of, but it was a push we had to make. That wasn't the focus. The focus of our present leadership has always been anti-Brexit, um, pro-immigration, um, anti-racist, and identity politics. Now I'm not saying, but that's what got spoken about the most, um, and so. I don't think that they would have noticed particularly that that the radical parts of our financial stuff had dropped away, and they they didn't. I mean, I, I personally disappointed that it was Corbyn who who spoke most forcefully about um, um, about austerity and um, the banks being too big to fail and too big to prosecute. I was really cheered that he did, but disappointed that it wasn't us at the forefront of that. Well, and John McDonnell as well, who who has taken some yes. advice from some, uh, like Richard Murphy, for instance. Yeah, good man. Uh, who who's a very good writer on um, monetary he economics. Stuff, yeah. He does know his stuff. Um, you've been interviewed by Real Media, who also interviewed him, and I'd recommend mm -hmm. you know to our viewers that yeah, Real they, Media, I think, are very good. They take a look at the Real I Media. I don't see eye to eye and everything, but I like them. Yeah. And well, they've interviewed David Graeber as well, of course, who wrote Death mm -hmm. First Five Thousand Years, which um, yeah. So I mean, we do need to get to grips with what it isn't, and and I I, I do think if the Green Party doesn't, if, if ever that policy of taking control of a money creation away from the private banks, if if we lose that, then well, it's a matter um, of political pedagogy, really, David. And, and your writing yeah. is so brilliant, uh, uh, illuminating these sort of dark corners of, of stuff. Mm. You know, the, the thing that bothers me is, that, amongst many, is that the, the, the endless stuff about have you costed this um, uh, policy? It, have you have you got a balanced budget? Uh, yeah. And um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any idea of what your policies might cost but the notion that you've got to come out with a balance sheet with all your policies and what they'll cost and your income and it comes to a grand ding zero zero expenditure balanced budget mm. is cobblers this notion that um the government shouldn't have debt i mean never mind whether a government should fund itself through the sale of debt or not which i obviously think they shouldn't and there's no reason for them but let's suppose that they do mainstream economists will go oh my god you can't have a government just really nearly printing up debt and and just make increasing the money supply because you'll end up like um like weimar germany they'll say and yet the same people who say that it never even occurred to them. They have no problem with the private banks printing up money and debt out of nothing. Yeah, well, you think, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Why is it? Why will the sky fall on our head if a government prints up money? But it's a fabulous thing if the private banks print up money, which is what they do. They they print up debt. Why is it okay for them to print up debt but not governments? 
it just seems to me that there's a basic failure to engage clearly with the the most basic part of the political problem. Yeah, well, it's ideological. We know that it's 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 it, it's, 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 it's not a necessary condition of any political argument that that should be so it's a it, it, it's a matter it of faith you roger that, that we have an army of highly paid so-called experts and pundits on, writing for newspapers and on our televisions and they don't question it well they're priests they, they, i mean they, they, i mean all yeah. of this assumption um, the same army without, exists it's, it, it's, it's, they are pushing an agenda and their job is not to think critically or to push the bounds of knowledge. Their job is to peddle the official narrative, which yeah, well, the we're Green all Party supposed can't to... afford to, to go along with it. The Green Party can't afford to accept those assumptions in its, when, when we talk about politics. Uh, we have to, because if we accept the assumptions, then we lose. Well, I mean, I, wins the argument. Mm -hmm. So we have to say, look, 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 hang on a second, your, your starting assumption is simply wrong. And get them to answer, why is it fine for banks to create money out of nothing and rack up debt, issue debt, but the same amount issued by a government, you're saying the sky would fall on our heads. How does that work? Just explain that for me first, Mr. Radio 4. Well, they define the Go boundary on. limits as well of the discussion, which you know, anyone that knows anything about algorithms know that the boundaries are very important. It's not mm. just the starting point, but, you know, also the boundaries within which you yeah, make where the predictions. Go. But that's uh, what the Green Party has to do. I truly believe that. If we don't do that, we're, we're a, a pressure group on the boundary. Well, and I don't want to be a pressure group. I don't think the country needs a pressure group on the boundary. This, this nation, I firmly believe, desperately needs a, green, a radical Green Party to be an electable party, a party that people think, if they were voting to power, they would know how to run the country. Okay. What they don't want to know is they're a country that knows how to play by the sidelines. Yeah. Well, what I think a lot of people struggle with, particularly like me, I, I mean, I sat on the fence on Brexit, and then as things developed in the States, it became better and better. But right now, um, I think it's still going to be fine. Um, and a neoliberal EU, why be in it? I mean, you don't want to be out of it with a more neoliberal government than they've got. But the choice was, you know, uh, fascism under May or fascism under the EU in the sense that May was like General Franco and <laughs> Mr. Juncker's like Stalin. And, and, and well, I, I, I partly agree with you. I mean, I, I was in favour of Remain. Um, but... My, the argument that I made at the time was it's not about what you might want to leave, but what you'll be left with. H had we been, had, had we had um, a Corbyn-like government, then I would have probably voted for... I can un but I, I didn't want to have to leave the EU and have an, un um, uh, an unopposed, unfettered globalist right-wing government. I, I, I agree with have. you. Uh, but I agree with you. A lot of the reasons for staying in the EU, and there were many I could I listed at the time, a lot of them were legacy things. You know, all the stuff about um, environmental protection, worker protection, phytosanitary protection, they were all from the golden age of the EU. And if you had been in, a, you know, for, for those of us who were in the TTIP fight, the big fight against the big mm -hmm. trade agreement, in that fight, the, the enemy, the people pushing, absolutely pushing for the dismantling and the, the selling off of all those protections, yes, was the EU. Yeah, Let's they just, were the ones. Can we look who, at that? You know, we had the document saying, "Well, we're, we're, you know, looking, uh, getting the submissions," and um, and people like Malmstrom were liars. They were yeah. consistently lying and misrepresenting yeah. things. So. If you were in that fight, you, it was very difficult to look at the EU and say, well, these will be other people that will save us from a, 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 a horrible yeah. um, Tory government. OK. Well, TTIP <laughs> is dead for now, but CETA... Only for now. Yeah. It's like the undead. Unless you well, shot it in the head, yeah. it will suddenly but stand C back C up. But CETA is upon us and real. And you yes, had the Wallonian uh, delay 
Uh, then they got it through the Parliament, didn't they? Yeah, and, CETA is a disaster, uh, and, uh, and TISA is coming after us. Now, now it's out to the different countries to pass, except the European Court of Justice passed the ruling about mm -hmm. trade deals not needing to be granted by yes. the countries outside. Yes. A, um, a, have you been following mine, that one at all? Um, I mean, I must confess I've not been following it that closely. Sorry, I... So, have you been following that one, David? Because I'd quite like yeah, to know. Yeah. So, so what's going to happen with that? Is it going to be something which Britain is bound to it, it, after Brexit? Well, assuming we, Brexit we will happens? be bound to it under the, under the, um, the um, what do they call it, the Twilight Clause or whatever it is, Sunset Clause. Um, yeah, we will be bound to it as far as I can see. And the, the thing about the law surrounding that is they are essentially making it as they go along. Mm -hmm. Um as far as I can see, we will be bound by that. Um, and there's a, I think it's a seven year, I think, I think they call it a sunset clause or something. Um, so yeah, I think we will be yeah. bound by that. Yeah. Assuming it goes through and there isn't some sort of challenge to the anti-democratic way of, I mean, it's the EU's answer to everything is if people look like they're going to vote against it, just don't get them to vote. Just take or it back if they vote the wrong way, get them to do it again. The Irish can tell you about that. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. So, so you, why, you, why is the Green leadership saying, you know, well, come on, let's get back in there? It, it's uh, the 2015 well, manifesto yeah, had, had a policy you, for a referendum. I'm thinking, as I did, this is a disaster. Um, at least there are. Um, safeguards in Europe, um, which they haven't dismantled yet, and, may, and won't be able to dismantle as easily as they can dismantle things that are just UK law. Did you Could I, I think it probably is true, but it's it's. It's a vain hope, um, I would say. Weak argument, I think. Should be reformed, and I I live in Sweden. I think Sweden does Europe really quite well. But the Swedes yeah. can do consensus. And British people, like you and I, well, you're an Englishman, I'm a Welshman, we don't do consensus terribly well. It's not really in us. Uh, yeah. Because we want to get on. Well, my, you know, I, I, tell you, I mean, I, 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 what's worried me most about the, the fallout from, from Brexit hasn't been the specifics. What's saddened me and worried me for the future is um, what I see as a righteous intolerance mm -hmm. on both sides of the art of the debate that that it's, it's an intolerance of the other person's position but based on a sense of righteousness and it, it reminds me of nothing so much as the the, ref, the counter reformation where it wasn't enough to disagree with the other side you you couldn't just say well let's agree to disagree because the other side was about to bring down the wrath of god and so it was fine to slaughter them yes and yeah. it's that kind of righteous intolerance uh, which I see as a rising kind of poisoning of our political discussion, which I find very, well, very... If I may say, I mean, I, I think the Green Party is very good at that sort of righteous witch hunting, as, you know... Some part. In some terms part. of burning people for climate change denial. And, I mean, I think a party that talks of climate beliefs, which Caroline regularly does, is actually in the realms of cult. You know, it's it's in the realms of being a cult and a personality cult. Well, you boot. know, we we disagree about the about well, about, about climate, climate change, change but perhaps. The, the, but but I do. I I I I don't think the Green Party. I wouldn't want to say the Green Party is more guilty than anybody else, but it's there in the Green Party. It's there in the country. In 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 every. Um, I mean, are other parties as misanthropic? Just the tenor of the times has become righteously intolerant. I don't like it. David, I mean, are other are other parties as misanthropic as the green, as as the radical green? By misanthropic, you mean the sort of well, <laughs> race doesn't survive nature. Yeah, I often see comments like, "Oh, what a terrible species we are," and. We yeah. deserve everything we get, or we are absolutely. All... I well, have I to mean, think the human race there is a beautiful are people like species. that in the Green Party, and um, um, there are people like that um, in, in other parties. Uh, it's not a very helpful kind of thing. It, 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 those comments, I think, are just people who 
aren't looking for a way forward. Um, mm. But um, I, mean, I think in the, the Green Party, Party, it's counterbalanced by a lot of other good things. I mean, I, I would rather have the misanthropy or the misanthropy, however you say it, that you find in the Green Party than the out-and-out -out callousness of the Tories. Um, yeah, well, I mean, no doubt it is there, and it, it exists in the Labour Party too. I mean, there are there are callous people of all political shades and colours, and there are there are there are very nice people I, in all I, of those I, parties. Which is our problem? I think our our problem is another very very difficult debate, and uh, 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 I, I think this is kind of a systemic. which I think is is hurting us. I mean, I, uh, would you say that debate in the Green Party is more binary than it ought to be for a correct sort of pedagogical approach to a scientific matter such as climate change? I, I, I don't know, to be honest. What, what I think is us, we don't have... I, I don't see as much debate going on as I'd like and and um like leadership it's, it's, it's would you difficult. debate um say Piers Corbyn about climate change I mean we could host a, a thing and you two could discuss climate change and and uh, he, he's a, a, a you know a full-on what 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 you would call denier what I would call I'm not a, sure uh, is he a denier I think he just says that there are different there are there are different it, elements it, and, it, it, and it, it, there are uncertainties it, in places where some scientists pretend there aren't. I, I think that Piers feels that the CO2 AGW hypothesis has been proven, has been falsified by evidence already. Mm. Um, okay, that's the CO2 thing. I mean, that, that doesn't mean that there isn't global warming. Um, there's a paper just out um, which is saying that the pause is actually real. The, the uh, all the debunking of that has come back and bit them in the arse, basically. Um, and uh, the, the pause is actually... Even Michael Mann, the famous hooky, the hockey stick man, has, has apparently mm. uh, begrudgingly admitted that it's less than optimal in there. Oh, but, I mean, there's no doubt about that. The, the, the model... Yeah, but I, the pause think, is the thing, David. I think it, 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 when scientists got pushed into pretending they were more certain about more accurate than they were, perhaps for, for what they felt was good, I think that was a mistake. It would be much better to say, look, the models do have problems, and um, there are areas in the models which are really unknown. I think it would be much better to be honest about that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the East Anglia thing I genuinely was think, swept though, that under the, the carpet very is quickly. Not, is not wrong, and that the that the risks of taking the other view, that saying, well, because we're not really sure about this, we should pretend that we should just say, well, maybe we don't need to act on it. I think that's wrong. Well, I, someone, I, I saw a, a, a cartoon which I quite like, which I can't reproduce for you, but essentially it said, imagine we a lower energy using, lower polluting... Um, more economically just world because we thought that this would be the answer to uh, climate change and then found that we hadn't needed to because climate world wasn't wasn't true wouldn't that be dreadful <laughs> well yes it would be dreadful but i mean one has to <laughs> you know what, to do the right yeah, thing if one models reason. climate one deals in probabilities and and the, sure. the, the 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 probabilities of some of the uh downsides of creating fuel poverty while, while um there's no need to create fuel poverty yeah, well uh, there's no need to... that's one of the problems of of the of of the way particularly i think that um big money global corporate responses are that they that their solutions might create things like fuel poverty or temperature poverty. Well, I, I'm happy for people to use less fuel as long as they're still warm and can cook their dinner. Um, I, I don't think there's any need for solutions to create those problems. I think 
if you're offered solutions that do create those problems, you need to ask yourself, why is this person offering me this rubbish solution? And usually it would be because it's rubbish for you, but we'll earn them money. Well, the rubbish solutions which I see coming, a lot of them come from the Green Party. Um, and you cannot, I've been banned from various discussion groups in the Green Party for being a you know, so-called climate denier. I mean, as if well, I, I would deny true. a climate. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's... I mean, you know, the climate exists. Who's denying that there's a climate? I mean, it, sure. it, it's just such a specious argument. It, it really is. I, I find it quite frustrating. The mm. lack of the lack of knowledge in discourse and the but closed-mindedness. That, 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 in fairness, that's always going to be the, the, the case that in any party. A, a, a lot of the people in the party are not going to be experts. They and people who they think know more. I mean, most people in the Labour Party are not experts on supply and demand of labour and how the economy works. Well, but they just except think that, that we've know. got Caroline saying and criticising the Queen's speech, not enough climate change, uh, criticising the debates in the election debates, not enough about climate change. Well, well, I think that was true, Roger. I think I think it it was talked about. I mean, in, in the the election was notable. Do, I mean, for, do you do you think if it had been talked about more, the Green Party would have got more votes? Because I doubt it. Somehow, I think the vote would have collapsed more. Out there now, where yeah. well, that's skepticism a, that's a is actually a valid Roger. point of view. Yeah, it's a separate debate. I think. Mm. I mean, I, I've gone on record for saying. I think sometimes we talk too, um, we, we, we reach too readily for talking about the environment when we're talking to people, and uh, which sounds counterintuitive, but the, 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 the light-hearted quip I, I make is if you were in bed on Sunday, there was a loud knock at the door, you tramped down in your dressing gown feeling grumpy, and there's the Pope at the door having got you out of bed early, and he said, did you know I was a Catholic? Mm. You might be a little bit pissed off and think to yourself, he got me out of bed to tell me what I know. Why don't you talk about something you don't know? I think most people know that we, A, are very concerned about all kinds of environmental matters and know quite a lot about them and have people in the party who know a lot about them. Talking about the things that people don't know about us. Do we know how to run the rest of a country? What it will take to to pay for, to, in, to legally do all the things that we want to do. That's what I think we should be talking about. But as, yeah. as far as the, the um, uh, election, the last couple of elections, the, there was, from the other parties, it was clear that the environment was still not on their agenda in any way, shape or form. In this last election, you're right. If we, if we talked a lot about the environment, it, it, wouldn't have, have, it wouldn't have helped our vote. Well, our vote I, that Take, going up and had nothing fracking, to do with, yeah. I, I think that's been dropped now, even by Theresa May, which is great, because uh, fracking is crap. You know, there's lots well, of evidence of that. So, so people like Louise Rothbury, she's brilliant. You know, they make money for the frackers. Yeah. That's well, and you've written about that in the States as well, and it's, it's founded on debt bubbles and, you know, pump and dumps and, you know, the... Theory of the greatest fall. It, it, it's a deeply, price. deeply mm. dishonest technology, and that mm. the whole, the whole um, politics around it is. It pollutes and it's awful. I mean, it's it's absolutely terrible. And but but I mean, for the, for uh, just I, a, a little while ago, and you know, it, it, the, the the people who are talking about fisheries and pollution of the sea, they were saying, you know, it's still amazing how people still treat the ocean as if it was just an infinite sink. Mm. You know, in, in all of their discussions, they were saying, you know, talking about all kinds of people, once they say, and then we'll put it in the sea, it's as if, oh, and it's yeah. gone. I, I think the Green Party has become <laughs> intellectual. That's precisely what the frackers are saying. Yes, yeah. I know there'll be hundreds of millions of gallons of polluted water, but we put it in the sea. Yeah. The, the Green Party is intellectually lazy on the environment. That's my criticism. There's so much that they could be saying and are not saying, and they fall back on 
denier denier and maybe, by maybe. Um, I, I, you know i know it's a bit i know it's a big thing for you i i, I think well I, the I environment is a huge it, thing for me i'm a confirmed tree the Green party i think is a lot less lazy than any other party let's put it that way at least uh, it, it, i think if the green party didn't exist the it's a very low would, bar would, would i mean i'll give you I'll, I'll give you that but one thing I find interesting about the Green Party, and I've heard you say it yourself, is we're the only ones that, or, you know, we're the only ones that care, or we're the only ones that can. And, mm. I mean, I, those sorts of general statements are never true. I mean, in logic, you can't, it, it's just not su uh, sustainable. It makes people feel better, but I just yeah. end up cringing, thinking, oh, my goodness me, you know, how, how could anyone say that? Well, it's, I mean, it's never if, true. if that's all you say, I agree with you. But I think it's it, it it's I would say that it's it's a true thing to say that the the Green Party, along with Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace, um, have dragged the other parties very unwillingly um, um, into having to talk about these things. Um, I think the danger is thinking that that's enough that that's our job. I mean, it, it, after this election, there have been, you know, okay, it doesn't matter so much that our, our vote collapsed because our job is to be there at the cutting edge and to drag the other parties, um, uh, to, 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 to drag the political discussion towards these more, um, the, the things that they, the other parties won't discuss. If that's all the party is, then we don't need to exist because Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth can do it. And, and, and that's not what the country needs. The country needs a radical party that can yeah. um, I, I agree govern with that. a nation. Let, let's and, talk... and, and if we lose sight of that, then there's no point for us, really. OK, well, let's move on to proportional representation then, because, again, the big <laughs> chance for that was, what, 2012, which the Lib Dems got for their ill-fated coalition the turnout was abominable mm. I, I it wasn't the easiest voting system in the world to and again it wasn't pushed by the establishment because they didn't want it so it's sure. yet another dishonest campaign mm. by, by establishment politicians on all sides yeah um, but what is about the green party that doesn't participate in its own democracy and was it 47 percent or 38 percent turnout in the leadership election amazing and an online yeah. vote and 38 percent of people vote or, or whatever yeah. it was it was very low yeah well i mean i i think the point you raise is a good one in the sense that if if the green party is a is a party that you know says we're, we're people who understand that people want to vote and if they're given the right things to vote and a system where their vote counts they will vote then our election is not a great advert um, it does suggest that um, and the failure having, to mobilize the vote for uh, a, something. a better voting system where, you know which we have we have PR um, isn't necessarily because if, if that was the case, if it was an automatic thing, then there'd be a 100% or at least a 90% turnout in the Green Party leadership election. And as you say, it wasn't. It was a 30-something percent vote. And, and so, so the other side of that as well is the, the Green Party saying, oh, let's lower the voting age, which I disagree with. I don't... I, I, I okay, would well, raise the voting age... There's too many, too many things 20. going on here. I mean, um, uh, yeah, I... I, I um, I'm not convinced that lowering the voting age from 18 to 16 is a good idea. Um, I certainly don't think it's a it's a it's a cure all, um, because I know some 16 year olds who are intelligent, incisive, and would make good voters. Um, I know others who are um, irresponsible, um, ignorant, stupid, and would make dreadful voters. And and, and what I see is that. Um, it's not that people start out at 16 being wonderfully intelligent, incisive, um, and responsible, and some point in their 60s, all of that dies and they become irresponsible, selfish idiots are there at 16, and the 86-year-old irresponsible, selfish idiots were probably selfish idiots when they were 16. Yeah, well, I plan so to remain one until I'm, I'm not 86. sure that it's... A, <laughs> and there's too, many, there's too many kids who are too... 
Pooh kids, not all, a lot, are very, very influenced by their parents. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that um, that lowering the voting age is a is a, a is a genius plan. I think of 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 the problems we face, it's it's not by any means the biggest. But I, I understand the green because we do, if under that, we do get a certain which never translates into um, getting a voice in Parliament, and, th and that system does seem unfair. We, we would have to um, be resigned to the fact that if we'd had PR in the last, not just the last election, but on before, for instance, um, we'd have got, what, eight seats? Mm. Um, and we would all have gone, yay, eight yep. seats, great, good. Uh, UKIP would have got, what, 20, I think? Yeah, which is fine. I mean, I, you know... A lot of the people who want the Green Party to get more seats are equally vehemently, passionately uh, against UKIP in, it, in all its forms and would be horrified. So, you you know, you have to be careful what you wish for. I, I, I would like CPR. I think it's a, 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 a better system than our... And our, our system is getting worse and worse through um, successive layers of gerrymandering to the point where it becomes dysfunctional. So I... I, th yeah, I think I, PR is coming, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's with us within five years. Well, I hope so. Uh, and, and the notion that, you know, in, in the, the election debates we had in, um, in Scarborough and Whitby, uh, we had the Tory candidates saying, well, the problem with PR is you end up with unstable governments. You have to make um, um, unstable alliances, whereas at least our first-past-the-post <laughs> system, you get, he said, yeah, you get uh, strong yeah. governments who can just um, stick with whatever they said they would do. <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, that comes back to the consensus point that, you know... <laughs> just, uh, I, even as he said it, I thought, uh, Robert, you are going to regret saying that, but, you know, he's a Tory, he's not going to regret anything. Isn't he in a safe seat as well? Although Labour did come within 4,000 mm. um, um, of unseating him. Um, yeah. Well, maybe they will uh, next time. I mean, I think there's an appetite for... It's not so much... It's not socialism that is attracting people to the Labour Party. It's the austerity thing. I think the Tories have cottoned on to that. It's just they're not authentic. You can't believe that they're being authentic about, you know, what Mrs May is saying about, uh, you know, we've got to do this better and prioritise oh, mental health. And I mean, their approach to austerity is just to make it more efficient. Yes. That we should all save more, yeah. harder, longer, yeah. better. So... Yeah, it's 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 problems. Yes, I agree that, that 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 this election was about austerity. With the success of your prediction that we would have an election within two years, yeah. last time round, what about this one? Are yeah, you, I think we'll have think an election might... before two years. But when we had the count this time, um, I said to Robert Goodwill, the, the Tory, I said, "Well, don't get too comfortable because we'll be back here within a year." Yeah. Um, but. Um, I certainly hope know, so. Making, making predictions about these things is, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, look, um, we've done... I, I, I can't see the Tories slogging this out because they can't really get their programme. They, they can't do all the things they want to do. She called that election because she thought, this is our moment. This is where we've got to go for it. And I do think the globalists, mm -hmm. of both left and right, and there are left-wing globalists, um, they are thinking now's the moment. This is where we go for it. Yeah. What and do you make of Macron the, the along? Liberal globalist that, uh, and, and I think that's what she wanted to do. The fact that it's not happened for her um, uh, means that I think that they'll just want to get s something substantive uh, agreed for Brexit so that it's so that we're on the downhill slope, so that we can't scramble from their point of view, you can't scramble back up. Mm. Um, and then I think they'll. Um, they might get rid of Mrs May. I think they would have before now, except who their right mind would sacrifice their political career to stand in her shoes. So she, she's got to be the one who ends up under the bus, and she will be. Mm. Um, and, then, and then I think they'll, they'll call another election. Yeah, well, give but, Corbyn the hospital pass. <laughs> well, I hope Because, I mean, it is I mean, a possible... I, I mean, I, in, in his case, it is... still in control of the Labour Party, Corbyn says or not, I think he's done the country a great service by at least 
throwing open the doors and windows mm -hmm. of our political discussion the way they had been been successfully um, nailed shut by the Blairites, as if the outside of the very narrow centre ground didn't exist anymore. Yeah, well, I think right, on right, those right. grounds, the country owes him uh, yeah. a vote of thanks, on those grounds yeah. alone. I, I agree with you, but the, and, and I want to see him in government, but I, I think the problems only start there. You know, we talked about the Grand Coalition idea. Yeah. Because you come back to money and the global money power. Well, this this is yeah. and that's the what I said part. in the election because obviously it was a very difficult one for me because I wanted to see Corbyn do well. I wanted someone to make sure the Tories didn't get a majority. So I, I, I was not anti Labour. So it made it very difficult, therefore, in all good conscience, to run a good solid campaign. What I said is, I I understand people want to vote a, a, a lot of the people who might have voted for Corbyn because. They see Labour as being able to beat the Tories, and I agree. The problem is this. I think Labour are the only party that can beat the Tories. Tories are the only party that can beat Labour. And our politics is stuck in those two sides, absolutely fixated on each side wanting to beat the other. The problem is neither, I don't think, can beat the problems and the powers set against this country. The problems that actually fate us I think neither the, the Tories don't want to beat them, and Labour, I do not. That's my problem. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm delighted that Labour can beat the Tories. But they can't, they don't yeah. yet show to me that they understand how to beat the problems set against us. I mean, it looks, it looks highly unlikely that they will be able to form a government without some sort of coalition, even with the SD, with, with the uh, Scottish National Party. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was... A, about what happened in Scotland, that the SNP lost so many votes. But I, I, you know, I wonder whether that was their attitude to Brexit. I, I mean, I don't could, know. Could I'm, well I'm be. No I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I think that's, 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 well, that's quite possible. Well, Brexit was tied uh, up I, with the, the new referendum. The problem Brexit thing is that, that no one has, none of the media have told the truth about Brexit for so long mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to feel, no matter what you've read, that you are genuinely well informed about the truth i don't feel I, it's a subject i don't yeah. feel i can honestly say D david no. we've got... has opinion swung against brexit mm -hmm. a whole set of newspapers and pundits will say, tell you absolutely yes and another set will say no it hasn't and and certainly the election vote would suggest that um Bre this rolling back brexit wasn't the number one thing for the voters. If it was, they would have all voted SNP. Yeah. Sorry, not um, um, SDP. SNP. So, yeah. No, Social Democrat, whatever. The, the, the Scottish call, National you know, Party. No, 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 no. I'm talking. If, one had, if, if, if everyone's opinion about Brexit was that absolutely we've all, all, all the people who voted Brexit now uh, have changed their minds and it was all. So that was really at the forefront of their minds. They'd have all voted for the, uh, the, the SDP, wouldn't they? Because they were the ones who said absolutely... What, the Lib Dems? Well. Yeah, the Lib Dems. Sorry, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Look, the, we've, the got a message, we've got a message from... Happen. We've got a message from David McKechnie saying that... Um, saying we would have got 25 forward. seats in 20, 2015, which I'm assuming that's either the Green Party or UKIP. Uh, uh, that would have been UKIP. Okay, right, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, personally, I'm a big fan of Nigel Farage. I know that will cause howls with some people, but... Yeah, I, it's, 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 it's not, I, I'm not a, a big fan of, of Nigel Farage by, by any means. Uh, um, I, I just found the whole Brexit thing to be... I think both sides of that debate could have made honest and strong cases. And it's, mm. it's a puzzlement which I think generations of historians are going to yeah. work away at. But the, ca the cases were there. I mean, to make dishonest arguments when they could have made honest ones. That's have you have you heard of Richard North? Sorry. Are you have you heard of Richard North? No, no, I don't think I have. Sorry. Well, he writes in the Telegraph, and he's written two books on Brexit, and they're brilliant. Um, oh, okay. Uh, and and he advocates a, a a solution called Flexit, and yeah. and um, uh, there's there are others. Uh, who, who have made, you know, very, very good cases. 
Look, we've been but, up this uh, an hour and twenty. My, sorry, Roger, but my, my I, mean, I, I was asked to do several public discussions at the time of Brexit, you know, where they got all the parties together. And a, apart from the business about it's not what you want to leave, but what you'll be left with. The other thing I said was that, and I, I feel this very strongly, that I felt we were having the wrong discussion, that we were being encouraged to be absolutely fixated on this question of staying in Europe or not staying in Europe, where I felt the real discussion we ought to have been having was about do we sign up to um, these neoliberal globalist trade agreements or not? Um, and I just felt that the way to make sure that, you know, if, 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 if a, a pickpocket doesn't want you to look at what he's uh -huh. doing with this hand, he gets you to look at this one. Yeah. I, and I felt that's a lot of what it yeah. was. I just felt, I felt that most of the problems that face this country would not be solved which, whichever way the, the vote went. Yeah. And, and therefore I said, the fact that we're being told to look, concentrate on this, get, um, get fixated on this, get worked up about this, make, you know, have this be the consuming issue that you concentrate on. Uh, I just felt, yeah. well, that makes sure that we don't look at anything. I agree really with important. you, David. You did a very good video called, list, uh, or blog, Listening to Brexit. Oh, yeah, uh, afterwards and, and I mean it struck a chord with me um, and, and you know I think you know you should be congratulated on that uh, yeah David said it, it was 25 seats the Green parties would have got um, and UKIP would have got 66 seats okay, uh, fine, in 2015 yeah. right. thank you um, for, for telling me that so, yeah, I, thanks I, David I that's that, very kind you know, I, I remember thinking yeah I, I'm in favour of, of proportional representation but you have to realise that other, other, what you might call um, extreme or fringe um, concerns will also get an area. Mm. That's that's what PR does. It means that the things which aren't right at the centre get 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 some uh, get a voice. Yeah. Well, and, we have it here um, in Sweden, and it seems to work perfectly well. Although yeah, I, I lots of people will say it doesn't. I just think but you need I, to be I, realistic. You know, yeah. yeah. So so. Um, Farage and you know the whole business about um, foreigners are the problem mm -hmm. would have got what was it sixty seats? Yeah. Well, okay. I, I, to <laughs> be fair to him, I don't just, think that's what he had one whinge about it. Yeah. So I think that's what he actually says. I mean, I I I, I don't think that's his view. Um, no, their their two thousand and fifteen manifesto was very similar to the Green Party. Um, manifesto apart from on green issues because he doesn't like windmills um and and wants to frat the hell out of the place which i think yeah, he's wrong I, about i, I, I think he's wrong a about that. discussion and, yeah. and, a, and a very fraught one about mm. the whole you know the yeah. immigration um racism thing it's a it's a, it's a vast i, discussion I, I just don't see as a racist i mean i don't think tommy robinson is a racist i mean there we are that's the cat amongst the pigeons but I, I, I really genuinely like Tommy Robinson. I think he's an honest guy. I've never met he's... the man. Um, certainly some of the things that he's been reported to have said alarm me, but I do, uh, I do know that some of the way that the, um, that the, early, the legend that's been created about the early years of him and that organisation has been a manipulated legend. And, and again, I just think you, I would rather disagree fundamentally with people on the basis of the truth rather than disagree with them fundamentally on the basis of a set of convenient lies it's 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 the resort to lies which is what is corroding our public life well, if you want to disagree with with um Conor robson then then do so on the basis of the truth yes well, and, and there's plenty to disagree with him you don't need yeah. to have lies to disagree with the man yeah i mean i, I you know? It, I, I, lying, dis I do not, disagree not with him with a lot of problem, things about about Islam. I don't think he's a very good theologian, uh, but I think... <laughs> no, that's uh, putting uh, it mildly. Uh, I think, let's not even get into that unless uh, we're going to spend a day doing yeah. it. Because uh, let, let's do thought. geopolitics. I, I wrote a, an article about it, and it was a very difficult article, and I did it with enormous trepidation. Yeah. And this was Culture well. Matters. I was a very difficult thing to write. I, I agonised about it. I and I, I sent it to most of the top people in the Green Party saying, 
what do you think? And they were reluctant. They 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 left. It. Well, I thought it was an excellent article, and it really. I, I think you were quite surprised because you you did say to me that you were a bit worried about it. Um, and yeah, I think I, I think I we were both quite surprised that it was well received. I mean, people do want some honest discussion. Yes, at the moment we don't have honest discussion. At the moment, yeah. I think what we have are people saying the point of view that I'm adhering to and the point of view that I am opposed to. Mine is so important and theirs is so dangerous that all tools or all, all, all strategies are justified, including. Um, lying and misrepresenting yeah, and yeah. the problem is when both sides do it both sides know the other side is doing it neither side wants to admit their side is doing it and then you have a recipe mm -hmm. for the poisoning of democratic yeah. discussion mm -hmm. and worrying. that's what worries me Roger yeah yeah can you do another five minutes should we do a little bit about what's happening in the Middle East and geopolitics and how that all ties in with <laughs> uh, 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 we've been at it an hour and a half, so that's quite yeah, a long we should time. Stop at 9 30. Yeah. People will have lost the will to live. Yeah, right? okay. Um, I think what's happening in the Middle East is I've felt for a long time that we are in the midst of the great gas war, the undeclared war. There's a northern theatre, which is Ukraine, which has gone a bit quiet, and there's a southern theatre, which stretches from Syria down to Yemen. Mm -hmm. And I think the great, the, in, in the southern theatre, the, 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 the teams are Saudi, Israel, America. On one side, um, the the um, Assad, Russia, and Iran on the other, uh -huh. and um, Saudi has separately um, got a huge um, argument, a struggle for supremacy going on with Qatar, uh -huh. and that has now got mixed up in it. The Saudis have decided to try and um, brand Qatar as being. Um, the, the the supporters of which is astonishing since if, if yeah. there's any country that funds ISIS and the rest of it and Wahhabism and, the, and, and it's Saudi but they fund those people the way they fund um, um, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and um, Al Jazeera you know Qatar funds Al Jazeera, and Al Jazeera is allowed to be critical of everyone except Qatar. Yeah, I mean, I and think there's I think a difference Saudi between Al Jazeera and the, all, and the Muslim all these Brotherhood. Religious fanaticism, as long as you don't do it here. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think there's a, that we are approaching a proxy war, and it, it, it is the, the hegemonic powers that, that have been uh, yeah. America and, and Israel and Saudi feeling threatened by a new set of powers. Saudi threatened by Qatar. I think Israel feels very threatened by Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. um, America continues to feel threatened by um, Russia and um, Ir Syria and uh, Iran are caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. It hasn't spilled over into Iran and I don't think it will. But... Um, but again, I've been criticised heavily within the Green Party for um, not taking the simple view of saying we should carry on overthrowing Assad because Assad is terrible. Yeah, what Assad did you make of Jonathan but I'm not Bartley's? Sure uh... Is the right way? <laughs> Iraq or in Libya? No. But but I get criticised heavily, heavily and, and told that I'm a, a shill for right wing dictators and that, you know I, I like these people, yeah. which is disappointing that that that's the only discussion there yeah. is. But that's well, yeah, it was interesting what you wrote about Jonathan Bartley's reaction and statement about Trump tomahawking Syria. It's a whole other discussion, Roger, for mm. another day. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I think we should wrap up now. Oh, and um, uh, what, I, what I'd like to say is I would really like it to know if people want to let Roger or me know if this was useful, if you want, if, if you had enough of me for a whole lifetime and I should just go away or... Um. Cool. Okay, and the stream will be live. And w what I'll do is is um, 
we'll, we'll come off air now so that process is and I'll put it on just to see if anyone hangs around and wants to ask some ask some some questions just just yeah. for two minutes if then, people want to ask questions yeah. then there, there are eight people in. still watching there were 115 at one point um, so I'm going to shut off the live thing for now. And, uh, well, thank um, you, Roger, and thank you, everyone on. who watched. And I hope it hasn't yeah. been too. Boring. Well, thank you, David, and hopefully we can do it again. Let's. Uh, mm. We'll just say. Oh, you should.